right, welcome everybody to um, this uh, research series event. Um, I'm happy to see that you've already been helping yourselves with some food. Please feel free if you want to um, get any more refreshments uh, during the course of our time together, so please do so. Um, I'm very excited about this event. Um, we have Professor Colton Fair, who's a new member of faculty who was hired here just this last summer. And um, if you don't know me yet, um, you'll probably be able to tell from the presentation, I can tell you about it now, he's a prolific writer in uh, the area of criminal law. And the topic for today's we're talking about is moral principles as defenses. And I was just speaking with Professor Fair, and he had mentioned to me that he's written something about a dozen articles around um, the theory of criminal defenses. And so this is a part of a larger body of work that he has been compiling over time. And he's telling me he thinks that there's, there must be at least a book in this topic. So you are in the really great position to be able to influence potentially the outcome of whatever book Professor Fair ends up putting together out of this presentation. But it's a really neat opportunity for us to participate in conversation with him about um, a project that's ongoing, right? An ongoing thought um, around a really important question um, with criminal defenses. So I'm not going to try and uh, pretend like I know anything about this um, or to tell you any more about what he's presenting on except that I'm sure that you'll enjoy it. And please welcome me in welcoming him to uh, speak with us today. Thank you, uh, Professor Major, for that introduction. Uh, so again, my, my presentation is called Moral Principles as Defenses. And as uh, you may know, if you have any uh, exposure to the criminal law, in the annual American legal tradition, uh, criminal defenses are broken down as follows. So first, we define uh, categories of defenses, right? And although there is limited dispute over what constitutes a defense category, the three that are commonly accepted are referred to as justification, excuse, and abuse process. But because these very vague terms tell us little about who should be afforded the defense, courts infer more determinate moral principles from the category. So for instance, the Supreme Court of Canada concludes that excuses connote morally involuntary conduct, meaning conduct that is not realistically chosen uh, due to some external or internal pressure placed on the accused. And justifications connote rightful conduct in the utilitarian sense, and therefore are morally innocent acts, according to the court. So courts then use these moral principles to develop individual defenses. And importantly, courts traditionally attach individual defenses to a single moral principle and category. So self-defense is a justification that takes its form from the moral innocence principle and the rest and necessity are excuses developed within the moral voluntariness principle. And as I'll explain, which moral principle shapes an individual defense dramatically impacts how strictly courts apply the common factors that are relevant to justification and excuse defenses. An abusive process, also commonly referred to as procedural defenses, that third category, they have developed somewhat differently. So from the broader category, the Supreme Court inferred two principles. So first, a prohibition against convicting accused where state conduct undermines the integrity of the justice system, uh, presumably because the objective underlying the state act and its effects strike a grossly disproportionate balance. And then second, there's a prohibition against convicting uh, an accused when the state's conduct prevents the accused from receiving a fair trial. And unlike justifications and excuses, these moral principles are not necessarily used to develop individual defenses. Instead, courts often permit accused to plead the principles underlying the broader procedural defense category. So if an accused can demonstrate that the state's conduct undermines the integrity of the justice system or renders a trial unfair, the accused will avoid being found guilty. And this difference between justification and excuse on the one hand and procedural defenses, on the other, raises several questions. So first, why do we distill justification and excuse defenses from categories to moral principles to individual defenses? And I suggest that the reason is simple. 
to reduce the often complex moral philosophy underlying defenses into element-based tests that are easy for criminal justice actors to apply. But this gives rise to a second question. Does the judicial insistence that individual defenses fit solely into an excuse or justification category render individual defenses too simple? In line with a growing majority of criminal law theories, I think that the moral rationale underlying defenses like self-defense, duress, and necessity can be pleaded as either justifications or excuses. However, if the moral underpinnings of a defense impact how strictly we apply the factors relevant to these defense categories, then I think fairness demands that the law develop different legal tests for justification and excuse versions of each individual defense. This, in my view, would unduly complicate the law of defenses, which in turn would give rise to a third question I want to explore today. Would the law of justification and excuse be better developed by mirroring the structure for procedural defenses and requiring accused to simply plead a moral principle as opposed to an individual defense? And my thinking on whether to rely upon moral principles as defenses is still at the early stages, but I'm not starting from scratch, as Professor Major mentioned. And instead, I'm building up upon a body of prior work on the moral principles underlying criminal defenses, a theory of defenses that I uh, recently got the attention of the Supreme Court. And according to my, my continuum of moral conduct, as Justice Martin called it, uh, there are three principles that I think underlie justification and excuse, moral involuntariness, moral permissibility, the novel principle I, I proposed, and then moral innocence. And in addition, there are two principles that underlie procedural defenses, gross disproportionality and that need to ensure trial fairness. And in my view, these five principles can explain why any defense is correct. And that's where I want to, want to get to eventually. And I think that this is a tenable conclusion given that the Supreme Court has used four of the five principles to develop criminal defenses. And then they recently concluded that my addition to their theory, that idea of moral permissibility uh, is a worthy one. But what I'm more interested in discussing is whether pleading the moral principles underlying the defense categories as standalone defenses provides any sort of benefits. And in my view, pleading defenses as moral principles can be structured in a way that is, is equally determinate, more efficient, and importantly, it better aligns the law of defenses with the moral philosophy underlying this, this complex area of law when compared to the Supreme Court's current construction. And I'll explain what that is. Uh, shortly. And to keep my, my talk at a manageable length, so I'll focus my comments on justifications and excuses today, using that category of procedural defenses simply to show that courts allow accused to plead moral principles as defenses. This idea is not far fetched. And accordingly, I'll, I'll begin by providing a brief overview of this distinction between what is an offense and what is a defense. And second, I'll outline the understanding of defenses adopted by the Supreme Court, and I'll contrast it with my continuum of moral conduct uh, that I think underlies criminal defenses. And finally, I'll unpack three reasons I've just devised so far for why relying upon moral principles might be preferable uh, to relying upon individual defenses. And when all that's done, I'd be happy to take any questions. So to understand why moral principles could substitute for individual defenses, I think it's necessary to first unpack what a defense is and what sort of pleas fit within this definition. And defining defenses is, is difficult to do without first outlining how offenses are structured. And I tend to agree with the late Oxford law professor, John Gardner, uh, that an offense is a prima facie wrong. And by this, he means that offenses are actions that are wrongful in the abstract. So the need to craft offenses in this kind of general way follows from the basic predicament facing legislatures when criminalizing an act. So obviously, it's impossible to draft an offense so that it catches no unwanted conduct whatsoever. Instead, legislatures tend to create bright line prohibitions, don't murder, steal, vandalize, etc and allow accused to explain why they ought to be exempted from the criminal law. And with this understanding of the relationship between offenses and defenses, 
the definition of, of a defense, I think, flows quite naturally. Uh, a defense constitutes any reasons provided by the accused that must result in courts refusing to find the accused guilty despite the Crown proving an offense. And two things should be immediately apparent from that definition. So first, it's broad enough to include justification, excuse, and procedural defenses, as each category involves some reasons being offered to be exempted from criminal liability. Justifications and excuses concern the personal reasons an accused offers for committing a crime, usually to protect their person, some other person, or property. And if, if successful, an accused pleading a justification or excuse is acquitted. But procedural defenses, on the other hand, uh, they involve reasons that the state ought to be barred from finding the accused guilty due to state conduct compromising the justice system uh, in some way. And while these defenses do not result in an acquittal, uh, they unequip uh, unequivocally prevent uh, the Crown from re uh, receiving a guilty verdict because the proceedings are ultimately staged. And the second observation that flows from this definition of defenses is that any pleas that deny an element of the offense is made out are not defenses in the legal sense. The definition I adopt therefore excludes pleas sometimes referred to as defenses like say alibi or intoxication uh, as these pleas deny the actus reus of an offense. With an alibi, the accused says, you got the wrong person. And with intoxication, one claims to lack basic physical volition required to attribute an act to another person. And what other pleas sometimes referred to as defenses fit into my, my definition of this term is really a complex question that I just don't have time to delve into today. Uh, but to make my argument more digestible, I'll, I'll explore uh, what are the three most commonly accepted justifications and excuses, by far the most commonly pleaded, self-defense, duress, and necessity. So I want to begin by reviewing how the Supreme Court categorizes these common defenses uh, as justification and excuse, uh, which is illustrated uh, in the graph on the uh, screen. But I also want to explain uh, the factors the court has identified that are common to justifications and excuses. Uh, and beginning with that latter question, uh, judges include something like proportionality between the harms caused and averted as a central feature of each defense. They then consider various evaluated factors, the most important of which are the degree of harm threatened, whether the accused needs to take any sort of safe avenue of escape, and whether the threat must be imminent. And despite self-defense, dress, and necessity applying these same factors, the criminal law has always preserved individual self-defense, dress, and necessity defenses. And it does so because the defenses weigh the relevant factors differently based on each defense's unique context. And the main distinguishing factor, which is also used to categorize each defense as a justification or excuse, derives from the nature of the victim. So take the classic duress defense where A threatens to kill B if B does not commit a crime against C. As the victim, C is an innocent actor. The Supreme Court says duress is an excuse. The defense is therefore filtered through the moral principles said to uh, underlie excuses, moral involuntariness, which requires again that the accused possess no realistic choice but to commit an offense. And as a result, those evaluated factors that I mentioned are applied very strictly. The harm threatened in all cases with which I'm familiar must be grievous. And any reasonable avenue of escape must be taken. And the harm the accused seeks to avoid must have a strong temporal connection to the threat. In self-defense cases, where A applies force to B to avoid a threat from B, are different as the victim, B, is typically a non-innocent aggressor or attacking you. And for this reason, the Supreme Court categorizes self-defense as a justification, again, based on who the victim is. And a moral principle requiring accused be acquitted if they commit, using the Supreme Court's language, rightful conduct and thus morally innocent conduct, uh, it's used to develop the factors underlying self-defense. So 
what that means is that the uh, self-defense test applies those evaluating factors very leniently. Accused need only show that their actions are reasonable in the circumstances, which practically means that there is no strict harm threshold to plead self-defense and the imminence and reasonable avenue escape factors are applied very loosely. And if distilling defenses from, from categories to moral principles to individual defenses has merit, I think it's because the structure serves a functional purpose. That's what this court's trying to do. It's trying to simplify the moral philosophy of underlying defenses for criminal justice actors. And in the context of justification and excuse, it provides uh, judges with element-based tests that tell them when a defense ought to be afforded. But categorizing defenses based on the status of the victim is quite a rigid structure that I think comes with a fairly significant cost. Is it pigeonholes the moral rationale underlying individual defenses into one principle and category as seen on the screen. And this is problematic if we accept, as the preponderance of scholars I think now do, that these defenses may be treated as either justification or excuse. And that takes us to my theory of defenses on the continuum of moral conduct, as Justice Martin called it. And when theorizing the, the moral rationale underlying justification and excuse, many school, courts and scholars employ a, a simple utilitarian balancing of harms. And this results in proportionality between the harms caused and averted, driving the moral reasoning underlying why a defense is granted. And my initial contribution to the literature uh, began with a really simple observation. Legal theorists assume utilitarian ethics only result in two moral judgments, one underlying each of the justification and excuse categories. Yet the concept of proportionality, which drives the moral reasoning in utilitarian thinking, necessitates three possible outcomes. The harms averted may outweigh those caused, justification. The harms caused may outweigh those averted, excuse. And there may be strict proportionality between the harms caused and averted, something in between these poles. And with that, that observation as my starting point, I adopted much of the common wisdom on defenses, where the harms caused are, are clearly outweighed by those averted, the accused conduct will be pleaded as a justification, asserting that the conduct was rightful and thus morally innocent. And where the harms caused are clearly greater than those averted, so the, the opposite, I agree with, again, the preponderance of legal scholars that the accused conduct is wrongful and therefore can only be excused if the act was morally involuntary. And an act will again meet that definition when the accused lacked a realistic choice but to commit the offense. But controversially, the Supreme Court maintains that proportionality between the harms caused and averted is an essential element of moral involuntariness. And, and this conclusion has been heavily, heavily criticized uh, in the Canadian literature. And I think it's also inconsistent with the, the work of the philosopher from whom the uh, Supreme Court purports to adopt uh, the moral and voluntarist principle, a fellow named George Fletcher. And he's one of the leading criminal law theorists from the last century. Fletcher thinks that conduct is morally involuntary if there was a threat to one's life and there was no realistic way to avoid the threat but to commit a crime, regardless of whether uh, the crime caused more harm than averted. And Fletcher's view that proportionality has nothing to do with moral involuntariness is, is persuasive. I think the Supreme Court just fundamentally misunderstands Fletcher. So consider two examples where in the first, the accused kills one person to avoid being killed, while in the second, they kill two people to preserve themselves. It's, it's really unclear to me how the first act could be morally involuntary while the latter act is not. The option of dying, I think, according to Fletcher, is never a realistic choice. It may be the noble choice in those scenarios, but excuses based on the etymology of that term admit that the act is wrongful. And if the wrongful act is not realistically chosen because of the most basic emotional response of self-preservation, the moral involuntariness principle, as Fletcher understood it, uh, requires a defense be granted. 
But in my theory, I, th I thought that the, the Supreme Court's intuition to include proportionality, simpliciter, in the law of duress and necessity was not unreasonable. What I contended is that when there is proportionality between the harms caused and averted, one is making an intermediary moral claim between the act being wrongful, but morally involuntary and rightful and therefore morally innocent. Where strict proportionality exists, the better prima facie moral conclusion is that the act is morally permissible. And describing these, these roles of proportionality matters because of the relationship between proportionality and those evaluative factors uh, that underlie justifications and excuses. And again, these factors include things like the degree of harm needed to plead a defense, whether the accused must take uh, any reasonable avenue of escape, and the extent to which a threat must be imminent. And at, the, at the risk of oversimplifying here, there, there's kind of this lay appeal to this understanding of defenses. If the harms were greater than those averted, so the accused is pleading an excuse based on moral involuntariness, we expect the threat to be something that is the utmost seriousness. Uh, it, uh, moreover, we want the accused to have absolutely no way out before they cause disproportionate harm. But if the harm caused and averted are proportionate, so the accused pleads the moral permissibility principle, we still expect the accused to take any feasible avenue of escape to avoid causing harm, as causing no harm is still the preferable result in the circumstance. If the harms caused and averted are proportionate, though, what purpose is there in requiring the harm threshold to be the same as for morally involuntary conduct, that grievous bodily harm threshold? I think the proportionality factor more clear, most clearly requires that this harm threshold be significantly relaxed. But if, however, the harms averted are greater than those caused, so the accused is pleading a justification based on the moral innocence principle, why should the law require the accused take every avenue of escape uh, um, as opposed to commit the offense? I think we want the accused to commit the offense as the act serves a social good. And similarly, we would also be considerably less strict when it comes to the imminence of the harm threatened as we intuitively don't expect those trying to do good to wait until the last possible second before they act. And a good example arises from an old necessity case uh, cited by the Supreme Court, where an accused steals a car to drive a dying person to the hospital. We're likely to applaud that sort of conduct and not evaluate other options that maybe were available to the accused with too much scrutiny. We're gonna apply those evaluative factors very loosely. And implicit in this theory of defenses, I've argued, is that self-defense, duress, and necessity can fit into any of these three moral principles. And that's not a novel argument. Many people have made it. Uh, it's just the, the novelty of my theory relates to the three moral principles that I developed, and in particular, the idea of moral permissibility. And, and this is in direct contrast to the Supreme Court's conceptualization of defenses. So as I explained earlier, its approach assigns defenses as justifications or excuses based on the nature of the victim. So in the classic case of self-defense, the victim's an aggressor, so self-defense is a justification. With duress and necessity, the accused harms an innocent victim in response to threats by some third party. So these defenses are excuses, according to the Supreme Court. But I think it takes very little imagination to think of circumstances where the accused and victim are not so easily contrasted. So for instance, if an accused provokes an assault, should their claim to self-defense, even if proportionate, be considered rightful? Supreme Court thinks so. But what if the accused mistakenly believes the victim is threatening them and uses force in response? Did they do the right thing or does their mistake, even if reasonable, matter in the moral calculus? Or what if the accused act under duress or of necessity creates a utilitarian good or at least does not cause disproportionate harm. It's somewhat difficult to call such conduct wrongful and thus morally involuntary, as the good underlying the act suggests a higher moral standing should be attributed to the accused conduct. And, and with this uh, somewhat lengthy review in place, uh, I can now state my position with respect to why the Supreme Court's uh, way of categorizing, categorizing defenses is bad, and I'll offer two reasons. So first, 
I think we should care about the moral language the law uses. So as John Gardner explains, to grant defenses without considering their moral underpinnings relies upon an astonishing assumption, which implies that nobody who is tried in the criminal courts deserves to have any self-respect. And a self-respecting person wants it to be the case that her actions were not an offense, or if they were, that they were justified, or if they were not justified, that they at least were excused. And Gardner's point is that how someone is relieved of criminal responsibility makes a difference to how that person views herself and is viewed by others. And I think that point alone um, suggests that we should be careful about how the law speaks when, it, when we apply a criminal defense. And then second, if defenses like self-defense, duress, and necessity can be pleaded using different moral principles, then the strictness or leniency of the evaluative factors underlying these defenses should be altered to account for this in various cases. And this in turn should affect whether some accused are afforded a defense. And I'll, I'll review another example in detail later on when I discuss the, the moral gaps that I think exists in the current law of defenses. But I think this, pro pro uh, pardon, this proposition uh, is sustainable as a matter of logic, as proportionality seems to dictate or have a very uh, um, good relationship with how strictly we apply the evaluating factors underlying defenses. A theory that ignores proportionality's role and instead categorizes defenses based upon the status of the victim is highly likely to provide unprincipled barriers to proving uh, defense. And as I mentioned uh, at the outset, uh, procedural defenses, so I'll come back to them very briefly, uh, they provide a useful contrast with justification and excuse as they do not always distill defenses from category to moral principle to individual defense. Right? Instead, the accused often pleads the basic moral principles underlying the category of defense. And those moral principles, again, prohibit convicting uh, the accused for an offense where state conduct undermines the integrity of the justice system or prevents the accused from receiving a fair trial. And while it's, it's interesting, at least to me, to think about whether all procedural defenses uh, should be pleaded this way, that's, that's outside the scope of my, my talk today, the fact that the court often allows for this, for, for procedural defenses to be pleaded as moral principles demonstrates that using moral principles as defenses in and of themselves is not far-fetched. And in addition, uh, the idea is not without limited academic precedent. There's a famous law review article entitled The Perplexing Boundaries of Justification and Excuse by a leading 20th century criminal law theorist, Kent Greenwald. Uh, and he has somewhat of a throwaway comment near the end that really influenced me when I was doing this, uh, um, started work on, on, on criminal defenses during my master's thesis. Uh, and he said near the end that, you know, defenses might be better pleaded um, by just, just relying on the moral principles. He didn't provide, though, much in terms of, of a defense of that approach. And it's always stuck with me. I'm not, I'm not sure what he was thinking there, but you know, there might be some reasons for um, uh, relying on moral principles as opposed to individual defenses. <clears throat> and, and taking my inspiration from from Greenwald and the Supreme Court's development of procedural defenses, uh, I want to explore three reasons for why it might be prudent to replace individual defenses with moral principles. So first, <clears throat> I think my approach renders defenses more coherent and efficient. So applying the continuum of moral conduct, it's simply necessary to use the proportionality of the accused conduct to determine the prima facie moral basis of the defense, and then pair that moral basis with its corresponding application of the evaluative factors relevant to justification and excuse. And, and this approach, I think, has a clear advantage uh, over the court's approach, the Supreme Court's approach. It allows for the moral basis of the accused actions to be assessed holistically, not artificially restricted based on the nature of the victim. And to be sure, uh, individual defenses might adapt by adopting proportionality between the harms caused and averted 
as the driving consideration for categorizing individual defenses like self-defense, duress, or necessity as justifications or excuses. And, and while I think that would be an improvement, it would require the law to adopt multiple legal tests for each individual defense so as to track the relationship between proportionality and the other evaluative factors relevant to defenses. And as my continuum of moral conduct already serves that purpose, further reducing moral principles to individual defenses seems redundant and inefficient. So second, uh, relying on a continuum of moral conduct is preferable because I think it's likely to prevent legal decision makers from relying upon other less transparent legal advices to fill the inevitable moral gaps that arise in the law. And, and the type of gaps I'm thinking of are most regularly exposed when a jury decides to nullify a charge, a practice that occurs uh, without the jury providing any reasons. And although the Supreme Court has endorsed this practice, uh, it's curious that the law does not permit judges to employ their moral compasses in a similar manner. A judge's conscience is at least subject to appellate review, and given the requirement that judges provide reasons for their decisions, uh, such a judicial practice renders the moral rationale underlying the verdict knowable. And the Supreme Court's most recent jury nullification cases illustrate it. So it's a case called the Queen and Crew. And the accused suffered from severe chronic pain uh, that was significantly alleviated by marijuana use. He therefore grew enough for himself and others in similar pain. And, and notably, as the facts leading to the charge arose in 1999, the law had not yet legalized any use of medicinal marijuana. And Krieger was accordingly charged with possession and trafficking. And despite clearly having committed these offenses, several jurors stated that they could not in good conscience convict, convict Krieger. And the reason is obviously that it's not right to convict a person for consuming and sharing medicine necessary to alleviate a severe medical condition uh, unless the state provides some clear reason to do so and it didn't seem to. And, and while I think this rationale could readily fit into my continuum of moral conduct, it doesn't fit into the Supreme Court's victim-based conception of defenses. So Krieger's decision to alleviate human suffering far outweighs any detriment caused to society by his limited trafficking in marijuana, I would suggest. And as Krieger and his colleagues had no legal means to obtain marijuana, it was also reasonable in the circumstances to grow it strictly for medicinal purposes. And Krieger's conduct therefore fits quite squarely into that moral innocence rationale as the harms averted are greater than the harms caused and his actions were otherwise a reasonable response to a threat to his and others' well-being. It's nevertheless true that the Supreme Court's inflexible approach to defenses prevented Krieger from pleading necessity, hence why he relied on jury nullification. Uh, he didn't plead any, any defense. The court's strict requirement that an accused prove that the threat was perilous provided a barrier as the accused medical condition was not life-threatening. And the court's conception of necessity, then filtered through the concept of moral involuntariness, requires such a thing. So he didn't have a defense, even though he ought to. And again, if the continuum of moral conduct were employed, uh, accused would not have to worry about these types of moral gaps that creep up in the law, and therefore would not need to run a trial on a hope and a prayer that a jury will agree that the law ought not be applied to them. Instead, they could be explicit about why they should be acquitted. And this approach, I think, aligns with both of the reasons I offered for abandoning the Supreme Court's current uh, categorization of defenses. So first, it respects the accused as a person. Right? And it does so by allowing the law to communicate the moral rationale underlying the accused action and letting that serve as the basis for an acquittal. And second, my approach ensures that the moral rationale underlying an accused act impacts how the judges apply those evaluative factors relevant to defenses. And relying on jury allocation merely leaves such a decision to the whims of the jury. And my final reason for, for adopting the uh, continuum of moral conduct is I think that there is a benefit specific to Canada to pleading defenses as moral principles. So to summarize, uh, I think the court's most popular charter doc 
principles of, of means and or instrumental rationality, like overbreadth and gross disproportionality, uh, it has really wrongly crowded out criminal defenses in my view. So these, these instrumental rationality principles prohibit laws that deprive a person of life, liberty, or security in a way that's divorced from the law's objective or has some sort of unduly harsh effect on even a single person, according to the Supreme Court's decision in bed. Yet exempting individuals from offenses that are improperly applied to an individual has historically been the role of defenses, right? More clearly stating the moral rationale underlying defenses would, in my view, uh, encourage defendants to seek out individual exemptions on a case-by-case -case basis, as opposed to using the blunt tool of judicial review of legislation. And as you know, this tool allows courts to strike down laws that negatively impact a small group of people, but otherwise operate in a legally tolerable fashion. And while judicial review is often necessary, I think it should only be resorted to when the law cannot find ways around those tough cases using the basic foundational principles of criminal. Now, applying defenses where possible to uphold the law is thus preferable as it respects democratic process in passing that law while also ensuring uh, that justice is done in individual cases. And, and I realize that, that latter point might be pitched a bit high. Uh, so I'll use the, the Bedford case to, to illustrate uh, illustrate the problem. Uh, and as a handful of you know, I have a book forthcoming uh, in UBC Press's landmark cases series on Bedford, uh, and much of what follows comes from that book. So as I outline, uh, my, my view is that, uh, and, and just, to, just to preface this, the, the whole thought of the discussion of defenses, my, my view is that criminalizing sex work falls outside the legitimate scope of criminal law, uh, because things like working in a body house uh, and communicating in public for the purposes of sex work, the two of the main crimes that are challenged. Uh, I don't think that they're harmful or offensive in the sense that should be required before conduct can be criminalized, right? But that, that ship seems to have sailed in the Canadian legal doctrine. Uh, so uh, the Supreme Court seems to have operated on the implicit assumption that um, criminalizing something like uh, working from a body house or, or communicating in public for the purposes of sex work is, is a legitimate thing uh, for the criminal law to be involved in. I disagree on that point, uh, but if the Supreme Court's right and they're going to continue to allow the criminal law to be implicated in sex work, well, then that raises uh, um, another question. How would defenses have impacted the constitutional analysis in the Bedford case? So in Bedford, I found paragraph 86 of the decision very interesting. The Chief Justice McLaughlin states that some sex workers, commonly labeled survival sex workers, are deprived of a, quote, realistic choice whether to engage in sex work. And as the court uh, very persuasively concludes, whether because of, and I'll quote here, whether because of financial desperation, drug addictions, mental illness, or compulsion from pimps, uh, survival sex, sex workers often have little choice but to sell their bodies for money. I think that that's absolutely an empirically sound conclusion. Yet, if a sex worker has no ability to choose her work, it seems probable, given the alarming amount of violence, again, detailed in Bedford, uh, that the Supreme Court rightly found is faced by sex workers from Pimps and Johns and so on, um, that she also has no realistic choice whether to commit a safety-based offense, such as screening her clientele before hopping in their car or uh, working from an indoor establishment. So even under the Supreme Court's conception of defenses, uh, the law of defenses was relevant, I think, to at least those sex workers labeled as survival sex workers. They had a moral and voluntarist defense based on the Supreme Court's own understanding of that principle. How this would have impacted the uh, constitutional analysis in Bedford uh, is, is a question that takes me a bit far astray uh, from my topic, uh, another couple chapters in the book. But I think Bedford serves as one example of how certain Canadian constitutional principles, those instrumental rationality principles in particular, uh, kind of have served to improperly crowd out the thinking uh, underlying criminal defenses. I would prefer that thinking to come back into the law uh, and if we stated 
the law of defenses as moral principles, it, I think it would be easier for defendants to see where their claim can fit within the traditional structure of the criminal law, as opposed to, again, resorting to uh, the, the blunt tool of judicial review. I think we should only use that when the criminal law can't otherwise get rid of the bad cases, so to speak. Well, that's, that's everything I have for you. I'm gonna stop there. Um, uh, happy to take any, any questions here, any comments. Again, this is a, a project that's really um, at, at quite an early stage, so. Uh, I was just curious how you uh, you conceive of this mechanism for judicial action. Do you think it expands judicial action or not? Well, in Canada, uh, we have the charter, or section seven, and it's been interpreted so uniquely. It, uh, going back to the BC Motor Vehicle Act reference, the court says um, we have, uh, or the, the concept of fundamental justice has substantive content. Right? Very, very novel in, in constitutional or in constitutions um, more generally. Usually it's restricted to the procedural content. Um, and this alone has given courts the ability to really. Um, um, fundamentally reshaped the law of defenses. And we saw that especially in a case called Rujic, 2001 Supreme Court, uh, where the Supreme Court effectively diced up the duress defense uh, and said, well, based on, on the principles of fundamental justice, a lot of these requirements just don't fit. So we're going to give you a new, uh, um, a different understanding of what duress is and then strike down parts of this defense. So uh, I would say already we, we have given courts the tools to be very active. And it leads to, to an interesting question. I've, I've written about uh, a bit, and I think I, I borrowed part of this from Steve Coffin uh, at Davos, his, his fantastic work. Um, but he makes the point uh, that if, if there's a constitutional basis for excuses, and excuses, basically the etymology of the term, um, uh, serve to provide a defense for wrongful conduct and justifications apply to rightful and potentially permissible conduct, I'll give a constitutional defense or a right to a defense for an excuse. Doesn't it apply um, with greater strength that um, you also have one, a constitutional right for, for a justification-based defense? So I think that whole uh, um, rationale is already set out in section seven, uh, and it all flows from the, the Rujic case. Uh, so uh, we've already kind of maximized the ability of judges to be judicial activists, so, so to speak, uh, in this context. Um, and, and depending on how you, you look at that question though too, if the judges were to say, look, here's the constitutional rationale, these are the moral principles underlying justification excuse, well, um, does that allow the, the, the courts then to actually be less activists? They can say, look, we're going to require you to plead an offense, do things on a case-by-case -case basis, that thing that judges are supposed to be really good at, uh, as opposed to letting them wield this um, uh, uh, really, really difficult to control sword of judicial review, right? It's like, think about the, what happened in response to that, right? Uh, you have the Supreme Court say there is an there's an, in, there's an instrumental rationality flaw with the prior sexual clause. They result in overbroad or grossly disproportionate uh, uh, effects. But what happens? All you've done is said spring, uh, to Parliament is based on, on this objective and based on this, this uh, uh, effect, there's something that's unconstitutional. Parliament comes back with laws that have many of the same effects, right? Uh, so, um, wouldn't it just be better to kind of set out uh, at the outset that here are the moral principles underlying defenses? It can let the common law develop um, a moral, say, a moral and voluntariness defense for certain categories of sex workers. Um, someone like Mr. Krieger wouldn't be falling through the cracks. Uh, that sort of thing, I think, uh, would allow the, the, the courts to do what they do best, which is just take cases on, on a case by case basis, as opposed to giving into the temptation to just start striking things down, uh, which really bothers me. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. So I think you look at it a little bit. I think the, the idea of a broader spectrum of course how it makes a lot of sense to begin with because you get more adaptive, flexible system. But I feel like even your point about the parliaments sort of speaking through how they articulate 
uh, offenses. There's a public policy component to certain offenses that the legislature is responding to some horrible act that happened in a court case and mm -hmm. says we're going to act on this. Is it not kind of taking away some of the ability for the legislature to speak on the kind of societal importance for mm -hmm. the sort of social responsibility yeah. issues if they're not categorized as that specific? Specific defense instead of as this continuum because yeah. I think about the defense of provocation. I don't know how that fits into the framework, but you know, Parliament acts on that because they say, "Hey, there's an issue here," and taking a wholly neutral or maybe you know non-culturally specific look at the moral principles undergirding that action mm -hmm. is not going to do service to the cultural importance and sensitivity of that issue. And so, my point just being maybe like, is there not still a place for? A defense first kind of approach for certain kinds of issues when it would be captured by a more neutral or more kind of flexible mm -hmm. proportionality mm -hmm. analysis. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question um, because it brings me back to my favorite topic in the world, which is the relationship between criminal and constitutional law. Um, so uh, I'll start out by just talking about um, provocation. Like, like for one, and you asked quite rightly, where does that fit? Uh, and, and the answer to me is, is quite simple. Provocation is not a defense in the meaningful sense of the word. And you can um, see that just by looking at how it plays a role outside of Section 232 of the Code, which is the, the uh, statutory um, um, defense scare quotes. Uh, if you aren't do uh, dealing with murder, what does provocation serve as? It's a sentencing factor, right? And then when you look at how Section 232 operates, all it does is circumvent a mandatory minimum sentence, right? We have mandatory minimums, we want to have some way of in most other common law jurisdictions, especially ones that don't have mandatory minimums, provocation is just a sentencing factor. So I don't think it actually fits. And that's why I wanted to be very clear at the outset on um, one of these slides here, defining defenses. Uh, I put an unreasonable amount of time into, into uh, um, wording that so that, I, that the categories underlying uh, defenses are what I say they are and that things that um, I don't think fit. Uh, in, into defenses um, um, would, would be um, excluded. So for, for my purposes, uh, I would think uh, if Parliament wanted to abolish provocation altogether, I, I personally think that that would be a good idea. Um, but the only question that comes up is whether there, uh, whether um, a murder committed under provocation would constitute cruel and unusual punishment. And, and I, I suspect not. Um, it might be dispros uh, disproportionate, but is it so disproportionate has to be excessive to constitute cruel uh, punishment, I, I would suspect uh, or not. So Parliament can still have its values there. And then second, um, um, uh, the, the other question, again, another really good question, uh, was whether um, you know, Parliament can still have its, uh, its kind of moral views factor in. And, and I'll, I'll talk about this question, um, and first years that are in the room, we're gonna talk about this on Monday. Uh, when it comes to, say, duress um, and the exclusion of, say, murder from the duress defense, this is a very controversial issue. Uh, uh, you know, the House of Lords has said you can never uh, um, um, commit murder in response to, to a, a threat from a third party or a necessity, right? That's the Dublin and Stevens case and the Howe case, of course. Um, so uh, in Canada, though, again, coming back to that relationship between crim and con law, we can do this. And, and we've, seen, we've seen the courts try. There are two very interesting appellate court cases. Uh, again, we're going to talk about them on Monday. Um, what else? Uh, they are Aravina uh, um, and Willis. So Aravina is 2015 uh, ONCA 250. Willis is 2016 NBCA 116. And the one with three. But anyways. Um, both cases come to different conclusions as to whether um, um, excluding murder from the duress defense is constitutional. And uh, the, the Manitoba Court of Appeal case written by uh, um, Justice Mignella uh, suggests that, look, um, there may be some reasons for why we would not want um, someone to be able to plead duress um, to a, a murder. Does, is this type of defense very easy to feign? Maybe. Uh, Justice Doherty, I think, came back at, uh, um, actually, I should think Justice Doherty's decision was first, but Justice Doherty's point was uh, that there's precisely zero empirical evidence of that. Uh, many um, countries around the world do not have um, 
murder excluded uh, in the law of duress. So, but that would be one way uh, where uh, uh, one means for, for the law, uh, for Parliament to try and impose its moral views. Section one of the charter. Uh, but that does bring us back to another sticky question, uh, which is whether section one has any role in, in the context of section seven breaches. We know that the Supreme Court back in 1985, the BC Motor Vehicles case, said that effectively this, this could almost never happen. There needs to be a pandemic or some uh, absent war context or something like this. They have all these extravagant circumstances. But the, uh, the Supreme Court in Bedford backpedaled on that. They said, look, section seven, um, and section one should have a more flexible relationship. And I, I think that that's reasonable. Even someone like Kent Roach thinks that that's quite reasonable. Um, and I, I tend to agree with Kent. Uh, and the reason is, why, why would we say that um, the Supreme Court's principles of fundamental justice, things that they just pluck out of midair really, uh, and call principles uh, that are fundamental to the law, why are those more, red, uh, uh, more sacrosanct than all the other principles of fundamental justice specifically included in the charter by, by, by Canadians, right? Uh, it's not intuitive as to why that's the case. And especially with these, these means and instrumental rationality principles, um, I, I can't see a good reason why some law ought not be justified uh, even if it violates section seven. Does that get at your, thank you, awesome. Anyone else? I'll preface this by saying that I'm not very well versed in criminal law. Um, and when we're talking about proportionality, you brought forth the idea of the proportionality of underdress, or I can't remember exactly how you're saying it, but either you are killed or you kill someone else mm. versus whether you are killed or you kill two others. Mm. And there's a proportionality issue with that. Mm. Um, is there room in the proportionality discussion or um, analysis for something that's a human nature concept of um, self preservation or preservation of kin? So, even if it says um, you're going to, you either kill this person or you suffer grievous bodily harm, which are not the same, they're not proportional to each other, or same for making a child or something. Mm -hmm. a child. Is there room for the consideration of? Um, just yeah, self-preservation mm -hmm. within the analysis. Yeah. Um, so uh, when when we talk about proportionality, and I've, I've, I've written uh, in the, the kind of first two pieces that I wrote on this. Well, first is called "Deconstitutionalizing Duress Necessity." Second is called "Self-Defense in the Constitution." Um, I I want to have a, a generous conception of what is proportionality. So uh, something like what message it would send to the community to require a person to um, not resort to deadly force, I think it's something that you can factor into the proportionality um, analysis. The, the example I use, it's a bit crude, um, uh, but uh, this, that's the nature of, of the law of propensity. Um, but uh, imagine that there's, there's a, a, a person who's been, uh, a female who's been subjected to a sexual assault where there is, uh, and it's, it's a very invasive sexual assault, but there's no reason to think that it's likely would we allow the, the victim to, to kill, to get out of that? Well, you know, it's disproportionate harm, but what, what message does the law send if we say no? Well, doesn't that send a very profound message that we don't care about gender equality issues? Uh, I would factor that onto uh, in the proportionality analysis too. So we can have some situations where you, like the strict utilitarian kind of conception of proportionality ought not be determinative. The pro proportionality as I conceptualize it is something that, that can uh, and it also has to take into consideration uh, societal impact more broadly. So um, I, that, that example is not precisely what you're talking about, but I think it illustrates the point that, that uh, yes, there is room for that depending on um, the moral message the law is sending if it doesn't allow for it. That's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, you, so at the moment, the way defenses work is um, you have to speak to you know, the two or three elements of defense and present an air about it. Um, how would it work if we adopted the proposal and we, we fled for the principle? So, so that's one, one question how would it work? Like, what would it look like in practice? And what difference would it 
So um, one way that it could be adopted, I, I think you could have just a common law conception um, that's based on a constitutional framework for defenses. Um, being a, a fellow who really likes to deal with good constitutional law, that's how I would do it. But if you want it to be, look a bit more practical, um, you might take section 34 of the criminal code uh, and say, well, this is defensive person um, and uh, all the relevant factors are, are there to duress, necessity, self-defense, they're, they're all there. And, and you could say, look, like the driving factor is proportionality. And many of these factors relate to proportionality. So the common law would develop it. Uh, and then you, you could say, well, here, here's, how, here's the relationship between proportionality and the way that will evaluate that. What you need to change in something like section um, 34 is the trigger, right? Like right now, it's um, one, one thing that's, that's missing from, from the, uh, the provision. I wrote an article on this, it's a long copy. Uh, but um, uh, it applies only to acts. Well, defenses are supposed to apply to acts and omission based defense, uh, offenses, so you probably want to include that. Um, but like when, when the uh, I think it's 34 1b says that the act that constitutes the offense uh, is something that is, is a proper trigger uh, for pleading the defensive person, well, that seems to capture again, you insert the word before omission, uh, that seems to capture any offense, um, and it doesn't require use of force like the old self defense provisions did. So something like Section 34, I think, is not terribly far off. I have an article on, um, uh, I don't think it's right. It's called The Moral Principles of, of Criminal, The Moral Foundation of Criminal Offenses and the Limits of Constitutional Law. Uh, it's coming out in the Bill Law Journal. Uh, either it's out or it's going to come up soon. Um, and, and I try and like, reconstruct Section 34 to, to account for this, this relationship that I think is implicit in um, um, the moral foundation of uh, the moral principles underlying defenses, constitutional law, and how that could help us interpret section uh, 34. It, it's, it's such a bad provision, and I know firsthand from yesterday uh, that students struggle with how to balance those factors, right? I mean, lawyers struggle, struggle with how to balance those factors. So I think uh, hopefully we get something from, from the, the court summary uh, that ex tries to kind of explain that, that relationship between. But I think it's just self evident to proportionality and, and the value of things. Then the second question was effectively why, why does that matter? Um, like, I think I really have to fall back on, on, on those two points. And the first, I, I'm a, obviously a huge John Carter fan that was recently passed. Um, but when I, when I was studying criminal defenses originally, um, I, was, I was working with Kent Roach at the UOT, I was one of, was one of those master students. And, and uh, Kent was pushing, uh, Professor Roach was pushing that sort of thing on me. Uh, and I read a lot of John Barnett's. I just love this guy, the way that he can, he can articulate very simply what the, the reasons are for why we grant defenses. And that uh, one question, or one statement he had, that, you know, it matters for a self respecting person what the law says uh, when it communicates using moral language to you. That's always stuck with me. I think that that's a, a winning argument in and of itself. Um, that if, uh, or when, when the Supreme Court says, you know, dress and assess their excuses, uh, and therefore it's, you did a wrong, but here, here's, a, here's a defense anyway, get out of my courtroom. Um, I, I don't think that that's, that's adequate. And, and a little bit of a, of a story. Um, so I, I one of the cases, no, I don't think I cited it, um, but there's a case called the Queen of Cal, uh, that's a 2014 SB3342. And the, Supreme, uh, the Saskatchewan uh, Court of Queen's Bench um, had an a, a argument I wrote, uh, when I was an argument student uh, about whether um, uh, the uh, exclusion of assault causing body bodily, no, the assault with a weapon and robbery, uh, which are excluded from the duress defense, whether those are constitutional. And I had a, a fact pattern where a guy was being told that uh, he needed to go in and rob a person with this tiny little knife or the other fellows were going to come and shoot him and use no witnesses. Those are the basic facts. Now, I remember when we challenged the constitutionality of Section 17, I said, look, I'm not just going to like, like try to read out robbery and assault uh, with a weapon. I want that word excuse in the defense. I think that's unconstitutional. So I, I took a swing at it. Uh, and and um, um, Justice Kovach, uh, excellent judge, 
not just because he agreed with me. In fact, he didn't agree with my whole argument. He just said, no, I'm not going to the excuse justification debate. This is clearly morally involuntary conduct. Strike it down. Um, the, the, the accused uh, can plead the rest and, and he did. Um, but then the, the Court of Appeal, uh, the Crown wanted to appeal it. And I said, no, I'm still going to go after the, the, the foundation of the defense. So I think that's where the, the real constitutional issue is. Um, and then the Crown pulled its appeal before I could, I could um, get into court on it. But um, I, 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 I think it matters for, for the, uh, when I think about when I think about Mr. Mr. Allen, I, I say it looked like his he went in to rob this place with a gun using the minimum or with a, with a knife, small knife, using the minimal amount of force. He told the, the cashier what's going on. Um, and then he left to go back into a looted prison, which was his car. I mean, that, that seems like a like he did something good in, in, in the, the whole circumstance. He had no idea what's going to happen to him after that. In fact, he could have been killed almost once. Um, to me, we shouldn't communicate by saying what you did was normally or voluntary. Uh, we should actually assess the morality of his action. Um, and I think that what he did was a, at the very least permissible, not, not rightful. Um, it was a tough circumstance, but we should um, allow the law to communicate morally like that. And then there are other cases, uh, um, and the Krieger case is one example. Um, but there are other cases where a person might have a threat from a third party, where maybe we want to allow the defense, despite there being some sort of um, lower harm threshold. And the Supreme Court now has built that in um, to, to its duress defense, but it still maintains um, that moral voluntariness underlies duress. So just put, um, back that up a little bit. Um, so the Supreme Court says that there is a relationship between proportionality and between the harms caused and averted and the threshold of harm. The Supreme Court has said that uh, bodily harm, being harm that's not transient or trifling, that really low threshold, um, that that is sufficient to plead the rest if the harms are proportionate. But that begs the question, how the hell is something, uh, some threat of harm that's not transient or trifling engage in your will? It doesn't. It makes no sense whatsoever. So there's got to be some other moral principle doing some work here. But what I said is, well, oftentimes it's the permissibility principle. It's it's when we have a balance between the harm caused and averted, um, and when we have this this kind of gut instinct to lower that harm threshold. Well, that that's proportionality doing some moral work for you. We should recognize that. Um, so I think that I think that there are potential cases where that would make make a difference. Now, the most the easiest one to pick on is Krieger. Because the Supreme Court seems to have had these very again, no one else will talk about this next week. Uh, but we, we have this very strict proportionality and payments requirement under the necessity defense. But then things get a little looser when we talk about the rest, because the court has had more opportunity to deal with the duress defense than the necessity. Last major case for duress 2013, uh, 2001 for necessity. So um, will we have some some uh, revision the next time we see a necessity defense? Um, I, I, I really think so. Does that get that? Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the questions, uh, Mr. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, talk about the, the sort of person right there when I'm sort of legal. So I see, like, I see why you want to get rid of the like, imminent harm requirement, but don't you think there are things that are while something more like the school to be totally not like where somebody can be like, uh, we should set them like them. Like yeah, and then like, like the, the question would be, uh, like, 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 is that um, um, morally permissible to go out and, and attack when there's no threat to your person? Like at, at that, that point, you're not dealing with um, threats to a person. So like my conception of defense is like, you're quite right to say like vigilantism is out the door. But like uh, when it comes to threats to one's person, um, that's kind of more the, the area that I'm operating in. Um, and I think you make a very good point. I really should have uh, made that, that, that clear at the outset. Uh, but I, I would think that we are dealing with um, those situations where there's threat to, to your person or to some other person um, that, that you know. Uh, and, and that threat is, is being directed towards you or that person. Um, and you have to do some sort of crime in order to get out of the circumstance. Sorry, I don't really follow what you understand how with the marijuana, mm -hmm. my understanding is that marijuana is being grown in stream traffic mm -hmm. to assist with pain 
Who was the threat from the music? Like, I don't understand what the threat is. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the threat is like it, um, is uh, internal to each person. I, I really like what's there. Could have to be external. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I think I mentioned at one point, I really, really want to maybe it was lost over it. But a threat can be internal. Usually, internal threats come in the context of, say, the mental disorder defense. But sometimes they, they creep up in the, in the law of necessity too, and could be a good example uh, of, of where that threat is, is, is internal. And there was just nothing those, those fellows could do um, about their, um, their, their, their illness. There was a group of, of, of people and they couldn't um, alleviate that condition, uh, what, what illness they had, but they couldn't alleviate it but for using marijuana. And it was before like any medicinal marijuana use was, was even allowed for regulations. Now, thankfully, um, I think maybe like shortly after Krieger, that's now allowed. So the issue kind of falls by the wayside. Um, but it's, it's one illustration of how, again, like the, what, I, what I call moral gaps uh, arise in the law. And, and sometimes they, they can be definitive in, in the sense that they, they prevent you from um, uh, proving a defense. And one might even go back to, to Dr. Henry Morgan's point. Right? He had uh, his uh, charges nullified in the 70s twice. Okay. Uh, and then, and then finally, when the charter comes around, he uses that tool. Well, um, maybe in the context, in, in that context, one could, like many other jurisdictions do, um, try and, and wrap the law of necessity up in, into that issue. Uh, but um, you know, the, the, the courts just just never really try. Um, and, and some again, some jurisdictions will do that, um, at least when there's, there's a threat to a person. Um, from, from the pregnancy, uh, it can lead to a very artificially, um, um, a really weak necessity defense in that context. So maybe that would be one of the situations where judicial review would have been appropriate. Uh, but in the context of, of something like, like Krieger or sex work, perhaps this is not, um, um, uh, it's not necessary to fall back on judicial review if we can craft a more uh, um, morally rich uh, law of defenses. I think I saw two hands pop up that was here. Then. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if the use of pardons and exonerations has any role to play in this morality mm -hmm. analysis and framework. Yeah, no, no, no it's, it's a great question. Um, so, uh, and, and this is really annoying. I'm sure many of my students are just, I wrote a paper on um, it. So, uh, it's in the 2022, maybe, not um, why we, because um, the issue kind of arose when it came to, uh, um, marijuana being legalized, and then people wanting pardons um, and, and, and um, exonerations, right? Uh, and, and I drew a, an analogy between when you should pardon and when you should exonerate fully, uh, and, and the duties that that places on the, uh, uh, the state, right? The pardon, we might say, well, look, like you did something wrong, we've decided not to, to go there and not to criminalize that anymore. It doesn't mean that we don't still think it's wrong. Uh, but we decided not to criminalize. So there, there's some analogy to the idea of a, of a you should have some sort of, of, of duty to um, um, excuse your conduct, to get your conduct pardoned. But with some people, like those who used medicinal marijuana, about those who were um, um, targeted because of their race, uh, if you can prove these types of things, like it seems like there, there is some morally innocent conduct that was criminalized, shouldn't they have a right to an exoneration? Um, so I, I did draw kind of a rough analogy between excuse and justification in that paper, um, and, I, and I think that your your um, uh, question um, could could maybe uh, be informed by that. Yeah. Good question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's any special proportionality and moral defenses. How, like, what your opinion is on Murphy's name and like, like thank you very much for Yeah. Um, and how that might have informed that decision. Yeah, I, 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 I actually don't think I've written on that. Um, um, and like, 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 like to me, like um, proportionality and reasonable having of escape, the relationship there. So like, even if we, we found some sort of proportionality there, and I have difficulties doing that, um, like you, uh, the Supreme Court's point was there was, or there were other ways to, to um, alleviate the, uh, um, you know, the victims suffer, uh, and, and those were what were reasonable in the circumstances. So like that sort of evaluating, yeah, the reasonable avenues of escape, escaping the scenario, scare quotes, 
Um, I think that those were the things that came around. So I think that was actually later decided. Good question. Yeah, I'm going to go back to the practical side of things yes. a little bit here. Uh, this, um, what's to stop def def uh, criminal defense lawyers effectively then just pleading uh, criminal, uh, sorry, moral innocence, if not moral innocence, moral permissibility, if not moral permissibility, moral voluntariness. Just to, and like, what role would the individualized defenses like? Would, would they continue to play some role in informing choosing which of the moral uh, depends on you to end up pleading effectively anyway, because with something is like a straightforward self self defense case, it's easy to concede. Okay, that's likely moral innocence, mm -hmm. but there would be like you've indicated this fluidity with that, where yeah, uh, the rest of necessity could be a justification, could be an excuse, and therefore like fall anywhere along that continuum. Mm -hmm. Like from a practical reality sense, would it just always be the defense's best interest to plead everything down that continuum? Yeah, and like, like, like we see that also, practically speaking, I, I was a prosecutor for a while, and the amount of times uh, just a, a litany of defenses were thrown at me, and most of them were frankly bullshit. Uh, I, you know, you just deal with them the same way. You say, like, like this, this, there's no prima facie basis for this defense. Uh, and eventually, you, you kind of would just muddle down, I would hope, to, to what the actual issue is. Um, and and like, like, like I'm, I'm still at early stages of thinking about this, because one of the, the new, uh, uh, like when, when you start to consider other defenses, and I'm thinking here in particular about mental disorder and consent to the extent that it plays a role as a defense, um, sometimes they might actually just fit into one of these moral principles. I've, I've argued um, that consent is really encompassed by the idea of, of what, what is morally permissible. Uh, um, and, and I can track the Supreme Court's decision in Jobin and all these other cases and say, like, like you're doing this type of exercise. You're saying, well, we're balancing. Um, the type of harm that we should allow people to consent to with the social utility underlying the act. So in Jobin, we have street fights. Those are socially useless. So we have a very low threshold of harm. But then we have all these other really interesting cases like the BDSM cases. Uh, so the threshold of harm probably should go up. Um, and in any other context, sports, hockey, uh, you know, like, like, like shouldn't there be uh, we allow more in that context because there's social utility in, in sport. But really, like what the consent doctrine is doing is striking again this utilitarian balance to say where we think that that balance is uh, um, allows to permissible use of force. Consent provides a full defense um, to your conduct, right? Uh, and so it's an interesting um, challenge that I have going forward into the summer uh, when I have far fewer things to do is to try and and and, and um, figure out whether uh, there should be, uh, or whether there are any reasons to still uh, like preserve some individual defenses. I think I have reasons to, um, at the very least, morph self-defense, duress, and necessity into, into one. Um, and, and maybe it would be easier just to keep those defense, uh, the, the idea of defenses as moral principles. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure where I'm gonna go with that because like something like consent does fit into one principle. Um, I, I tend to agree with the Supreme Court that when mental disorder is a defense, um, it, uh, it, it's because there's some internal pressure on a person um, that deprives them of, of, of any morally, uh, morally voluntary uh, choice uh, whether to commit an act. Uh, so I, I tend to think that that does fit into the, the, the moral and voluntary principle. Um, so uh, it's one of the challenges I have moving forward. Is like, like, do we do we just distill things into um, um, individual defense, uh, um, kind of, uh, broader individual defenses, like say defense of person, but then still preserve other defenses like consent and mental disorder, uh, or uh, is there more to be gained from just pleading the moral principle? And, and yeah, so I, I'm, I'm just glad I say I'm at the early stages of, of this thinking. Like, like these are things I'm still grappling with. Uh, I'm not sure where it's gonna, where it's gonna go. Yeah. I think time? we should probably wrap up there. Um, it's quarter after two. Yes. Okay. So we can kind of, yeah, we have, some, I know you have classes and things as well. So um, first, um, please join me in thanking Professor Fair for his presentation. <laughs> Also, just this is the, the final research series event for the year. Um, so I just wanted to say a few thank yous. I wanted to say thank you to all the people who presented.
So thank you to Professor Farish, to Professor Makalaj, to Professor Chambers, to Professor Dia, to Professor Hunt, to Professor Gautier, Professor Sam Beswick from UBC. Oh, well, I'm going to forget somebody. Oh, well, oh, Professor Malone as well. Um, all the presenters who presented as a part of the research series has made, I think, a wonderful uh, set of events for this year. I'd like to thank the Dean and her office for sponsoring these events, for giving us not cookies today, vegetables <laughs> and coffee, cake. We have cake. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank um, Kara Karpluck, who is our special events coordinator at the Faculty of Law. She's done an incredible amount of work putting everything together. Um, and I'm so, so grateful for her uh, for consistent efforts that she puts into this. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you. You know, you came today, but many of you have come regularly and you coming and participating in these events really does help to enrich the intellectual culture of our faculty. So I hope you've enjoyed them. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, and please come back next year when we have some more things going on. So thank you very much. And I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. And also uh, we, should, we should thank uh, Professor Major for organizing all of this. Thank you. Please help yourself.